Our Father, I want to thank you for this evening. We bless you, Lord, for bringing us together to be partakers of this retreat crusade. We thank you because, Lord, of your own will and purpose, you have kept us. We are praying, God, as we look at this subject on consecrated pilgrims on the way to heaven, I ask, O oh God, that you speak to each and every one of us in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you clear, your spirit will clear our mind and we'll have a clear understanding of the message you have for us at this moment. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name, I pray. I want to welcome every one of us to this retreat crusade, particularly to this session of the program. We're looking at the subject, the consecration of heavenly-minded citizens. Consecration of heavenly-minded citizens. Now, we are talking to those who have identified with Christ at the point of salvation. We are talking to those who have become born again, who could profess to be on their way to heaven. And the Lord is saying there is a level of commitment and consecration that is expected of us as we journey towards heaven. Now, let's look at the Bible to see what was the level of consecration and commitment that the people who had gone before us exhibited when they became born again? What is the demand of Christ on us when we become kingdom citizens? Paul the Apostle in 2 Timothy, in his charge through the inspiration of the Spirit to Timothy, he said in chapter 1, from verse 1, Paul, 2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, when you look at those two verses that I've read, you will understand that Paul was writing to Timothy as a believer. He was writing to Timothy as somebody who had had an encounter with Christ. He said, he is my son, dearly beloved son. He said, the grace of God had appeared unto him. He had taught him to re 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 renounce unclean works and is now a born again Christian. He said, therefore, with this in mind, the Spirit of God is causing me to write unto you, Timothy, and by extension to us today as believers, those who have been born again, to whom the, the grace of God had appeared. He said, I thank God, whom I son from my forefathers, with pure conscience, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, be mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also, verse 6 now, wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by putting on the on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind, be not dear, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10, but is not made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. When those, in those 12 verses that I read, there are quite a lot embedded 
in those verses. Number one, we see that Timothy was a born-again Christian. Number two, we see that Timothy was somebody who was on his way to heaven. Number three, we realize that Timothy was faced with challenges, both of ministry and of life. Hence, Christ, Paul told him, you need not to be ashamed, not only ashamed of, pro, uh, of professing your faith before all men, but also you need not to entertain fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear. You should be able to stand for your faith at whatever price it will cost you. And the same charge that T Paul was giving to Timothy, the Spirit of God is charging us today as believers that when we become born again, when we, our, we say our name is written in the book of life, and Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, that there's a need for us to be committed to that profession. There's a need for us to be prepared to pay the price, to see through our profession in Christ Jesus. And if we say we're on our way to heaven, that the journey to heaven is not a bed of roses. The journey to heaven has some challenges. The journey to heaven, the devil will put some stumbling blocks in your way. It takes consecration and an avowed determination to follow through our confession in order to make it to heaven. Hence, this evening, I'm talking to us on the subject, the consecration of heavenly-minded citizens. And if you look at the scriptures, Believers are variously described as pilgrims. We are described as sojourners here on earth. We are described not only as pilgrims and sojourners, we are described as strangers on earth here. You understand, therefore, that when you say somebody is a pilgrim, it means where he is at the moment is a temporal abode. And that he will not begin to build permanent structure in his place of pilgrimage because he has a home country. When he says somebody is a stranger, it means he's not a citizen of where he lives in. He's a citizen of another country. By extension, as believers, we are pilgrims on the way to heaven. By extension, as believers, we are strangers here on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our final abode is, is, is heaven. And God is calling every one of us who are those minded that want to make heaven, that want to be consecrated to get, see, making heaven. And the question is, what does it mean to be a consecrated heavenly minded citizen? What does it take to be consecrated? What will the Lord expect of you? What will he expect of me? And as pilgrims on our way to heaven, we are required to lay everything on the altar. The Bible refers to us as a chosen generation. We are the royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. A peculiar people, strangers and pilgrims on earth. We are called out of darkness into the, into the marvelous light of the Lord. We are no longer part of darkness of the world. We are no longer entangled with the things of the world. We are called to follow the full steps of Christ in all things and in every area of our lives. Whether we are amongst people or we are not with people, we are called to follow the full steps of Christ. We should be asking ourselves the question at all times, what will Christ do in this situation? As pilgrims, we must be consecrated to a life of holiness, a life of humility, not to, to make it to heaven. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to read verse 14. Hebrews 13 verse 14. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. None of us will live on earth forever, but one day we will live for eternity. We will live for heaven. We will live for eternity. If we live right and we live according to the word of God, we will make heaven. But if we don't live according to the word of God, we live by the dictates of our mind. We live by the dictates of the cultures of the world. We live by the dictates of the philosophies of the world. We cannot have the, an eternal abode with Christ. My prayer is that you will make it to heaven in Jesus' name. Our Lord and Savior, he forsook all who are not here in order to make sons and daughters of God, of sinners. 
He came to reconcile the sinning world unto, him, unto himself and unto God. He broke the middle world of partition between us and God. Those of us who were outside the commonwealth of Israel, as a result of the sinful nature, he became and grafted us into the covenants of promise. And if that is the case, and we remain engrafted in the covenant of promise, then we enjoy the benefits of kingdom citizens here on earth, and eventually we make it to heaven. We enjoy the benefit of being in the presence of the God of the Lord forever and ever. I pray that you will make it in Jesus' name. You see, it is important for you and for me to consecrate our all on the altar for us to be sanctified, for us to be set apart unto the Lord. Look at First, first Corinthians chapter 6. From verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 18. Look at what Paul the Apostle was saying to the Corinthian church. From verse 18, he said, flee fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye were, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. I want us to read that verse 20 once again. He said, for ye are bought with a price. You have got the price, the price of the blood of Jesus, the price of the sacrifice of Jesus. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. The Bible is very clear. How we are supposed to be consecrated unto him. Our mind, our spirit is not only to be consecrated unto him, even our body. That is, our body, the things we put on, the things we use our hands to do, the things we look on, they should be such that will be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. That is a complete consecration that God is expecting from us. Paul the Apostle, in writing to Timothy, he attested to the fact that he, Paul, the Apostle, uh, Paul was once a sinner, but received the grace of God for redemption. Jesus called him on the way to Damascus, and he responded by yielding his totality to him. From the moment of his encounter with Christ, on the way to Damascus, Paul yielded his all to the Lordship of Christ without reservation. The effect of God's grace in the life of anyone who professes salvation it should, be, should bring about a definite di difference between the former life and the new life. Must I say, it must bring about a dramatic, radical change in our speech, in our courage, in our things we aspire to us. Every, the underlining thing that should define everything we do is that what will God have me do? Until we get to that point in our journey, until we get to that point in our followership of Christ, we are not yet entirely consecrated unto him. You see, the conversion and transformation of Paul is an example of what it takes to, and what the grace of God can do and what it takes to be a follower of Christ in the life of one who had become converted. Paul has this testimony before now that he was chief of sinners, but when he became born again, he was no longer a part-time saint and a part-time sinner. He was no longer a member of the Sanhedrin and a member of the Church of God. He was no longer a member of the elites, el ruler, 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 elites of, of his nation, even though he had the qualification, even though he had the learning, even though he had the po po position in the world before, he said, what things were gained to me, I counted them but lost for Christ. You see, when we become born again, what the Lord is saying, consecration will take some things from us, and consecration will mean that we are giving everything to God, anything that will stand between us, and seeing God will take it away from our life. And I pray that you and I, and everyone that is hearing me today, that the Lord will help us, to be able to experience that dramatic, radical change of life when we say we are born again in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 22. Look at what Paul had to say. Acts chapter 22. I want to read from verse 6. Acts 22, from verse 6. 
The Bible says, and it came to pass that as I made my journey, I was come now unto Damascus. About noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, arise and go in, into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are pertinent for thee to do. And when I could not see, for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came unto Damascus. I came unto Damascus. Do you notice here that Paul had a definite encounter with Christ? And later in his life, he said, after he heard his voice, after he had his charge, after he was called unto thee, he said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I made sure that that voice kept ringing in my mind. I made sure I'm in constant touch with that voice that called me. John 3, verse 8. The gospel that comes to St. John, chapter 3, verse 8. John, chapter 3, verse 8. It says there, the wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the wind, the sound thereof, but canst not tell when it cometh. And when I go, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. What does it mean? It means that when you become born again, your life, your action are now directed by the Holy Spirit of God. Three points quickly we are going to consider. Number one, the call and conversion of heaven-bound citizens. The call and conversion of heaven-bound citizens. Number two, the constraints and the conduct of ex-based heaven-bound pilgrims. The, the constraints and conduct of earth-based and heaven-bound pilgrims. Number three, the consecration, conviction of heavenly-minded citizens. The consecration and convictions of heavenly-minded citizens. Look at point one, the call and conversion of heaven-bound citizens. Let me say this. Before you can be a heavenly citizen, before you can be heaven bound, there must be a necessary foundation. And the foundation is the foundation of conversion. Paul the Apostle, in the passage where I read to us, in Acts, in, uh, in Acts where I read earlier in chapter 22, he narrated how he had the voice of Christ, how he was called from the religious of the elders, religious of the fathers, the blinded zealousness for the religion of the Father, how he was called to follow Christ. He had his testimony that he met with the Lord. Until somebody meets with Christ, until you become converted, you cannot say you are on the way to heaven. All those who are heaven bound, all the heavenly minded citizens are the people who, are born, who have been born again. Look at what it says in 1st, 2nd Timothy, where we read earlier, the testimony about about Paul and also about Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 1, I want to read verse 1, 5, and then 9 to 10. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. He said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Look up, please. Do you notice that Paul was saying, number one, I'm called to be an apostle, not because I chose to, not because it's something I decided by myself, but it was, it was, I'm called by the will of God, not a, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. It means that my apostleship is not based on the traditions of the church. My apostleship is not the call of man. And let's stretch it a little bit. Our becoming Christians is not because my father is in the church, my mother is a leader in the church, my father is a leader in the church, is a call, personal call that Christ makes to us. The question is, have you had that call? Do you have the foundation we are talking about? 
Look at what it says in verse 5. From verse 5, when I call to remember the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which also which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. I am persuaded that it is in thee also. Verse 5 says, Timothy, I know you have this history of your parents or your grandparents being Christians, being religious, but that will not suffice. Because one thing is, you too have that personal testimony. There are many in the church today, in Christendom today, they are there because that is uh, my family religion. Family, you know, having Christianity and family religion does not put you on the road to heaven. It is when, like uh, Timothy here, you have a personal testimony that like your grandmother or your mother, that you too, the faith of your father, the faith of your mother is in you. Not because you have been born in the church, you have been baptized in the church, you have been confirmed in the church. No, 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 no. That is not what makes one a heaven citizen. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 to 10. It says, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our words, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You see, that verse is saying, this is what salvation is not. Salvation is not on our thumbs. We cannot be truly saved, saved, saved to live our lives our own way. No, we cannot. Salvation is not the salvation that is on our own terms. It's on the terms of God. Number two, salvation is not on our own merit. Salvation is not our own merit. Our good work does not qualify us for salvation. Well, I don't say it should be bad for anybody. It does not matter. He said we are called, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. No, our salvation is, is a call according to the grace of God. Salvation is a call that we must do God's own purpose, God's revealed will. Let me finish that verse of scripture. He says, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but it's not made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, through the gospel. So when we become born again, we need to understand that God is calling us on his own terms, not on our own terms, just like the religious Jews who were establishing their own righteousness abandon the righteousness of God. It was it also, God is calling us to fulfill his own purpose. We cannot become born again and then live our life the way we want. We live our life, where, well, this is the way I feel like living my Christian life. No, when you become born again, your feeling does no longer matter. It is what God says that is important. The question that comes, therefore, to every one of us is this, that now that we say we are born again, now that we are saved, are you living according to the terms of God? Are you living to fulfill the purpose of God, the calling of Christ, the reason for which Christ came to die and, and redeem us? Are you fulfilling it? Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I want to read from verse 3. Matthew 18 from verse 3. He says, And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Number one, conversion. Number two, like little children. What does it mean to be converted? That means you change from a particular state you were to a new state. The things I used to do, I do them no more. Brethren and sisters, this is the call. This is the foundation for heaven-bound citizens. That is, we are converted, we are changed, we are transformed, we are renewed. We are not just religious, but we are transformed totally. Our dressing is affected. Glorify God in your body. What we eat, what we ingest into our body is affected. Glorify God in your body. And then not only that, the places we go, they are, is affected. That's what it means to be a Christian. The things I used to do, I do them no more. And then glorify God in your spirit. You are no more taking lewd thoughts. 
You are no more allowing the thoughts of the world and the thoughts of unrighteousness in your mind. And I pray God will give us understanding in Jesus' name. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, he tells us there that he was the chief of sinners, but he was transformed. He was transformed. 1 Timothy chapter 1, I read from verse 14. He said, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came unto the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Of whom I am chief. He saved me. Even though I, got, I went so far, in fact, I got to the point that I was the chairperson of those who were hailing and persecuting believers and killing them and sending them to untimely uh, eternity. But God saw I did all that in ignorance. And God saved me. You see, no matter how far you have gone in your life, you say, well, I have done so bad. You cannot go beyond redemption. The grace of God is still available today, and you'll be saved in Jesus' name. Uh, also, we notice that, the, you look at what it says in Titus chapter 2, the impact of when we become born again, the impact of grace, the impact of salvation, when it happens to us. Look at first Titus chapter 2, from verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, not some iniquity, all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, special people, zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thy youth. I pray you be peculiar unto God in Jesus' name. Lord, let's read from verse 11. He said, for the grace of God, that bring their salvation appear to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, not in the world to come, but here, that the, the country where you live is this present world, the community where you live is this present world, the hamlets where you live is this present world. Say, no matter the prevailing culture, no matter the prevailing morals and the values that are, the, are, are in the society where you live, in, live above them. Don't become a slave of your community. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is, be, that is being zealous of good works. He said, who, he said, look at what he now says, teaching us to deny ungodly and worldly laws. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You couldn't have put it better. Expecting heavenly transformation, uh, heavenly citizenship. We live expectant that we are going to make heaven. And what qualifies us is by living above the corruptions of the world. And we cannot be exposed to the transforming grace of God and be living the sins of the former life. Should we, can we continue in sin and as that grace may abound? Say, God forbid. No. When we become born again, we are living a new life. We are living a transformed life. That is what the Bible expects. We must be separated from the pollutions of the world. We must vote with the politics of the world. We must be separated from the corruptions of our community, the contamination of our place of war, the practices of the world, the things that are going on around us. Our life must be contrary to them. We don't become, we are, we are not saying we should be antagonistic, but rather our life should be like the salt and the light that shed light onto the darkness and the dark practices of the community where we live in. We must also be separated from worldly amusement. Adultery, homosexuality, worldly attires, worldly adornments, not only that, worldly ambitions, ambitions that do not glorify God. We will not walk in places where if Christ comes, you will not be happy with us. You will not walk in a via parlor, for example. You will not walk in a place where they are doing things that if Christ should visit you in that place, Christ will be ashamed. If Christ will not even enter into the place. You see, so God will help us in Jesus. We will be separated from this sinful actions and activities. The Bible says evil companionship corrupts good manners. Evil communication corrupts good manners. We must be separated from those who are corrupt. They may not, they must not be our friends. And I pray God will give us understanding. So, bro, my brothers, my sisters, this is the foundation of being on your way to heaven. 
And until you have this basic foundation, until you have this basic experience, you cannot say you are on your way to heaven. You cannot say you are a sitting, sitting, sitting heaven citizen. Now, the question is, now we are born again. Now we are saying, we are not translated immediately to heaven. We are still living a life. We still have a life here on earth. And, that, and what should be then our type of life? What are the things that should guide our life? That brings me to point two, the constraints and the conducts of earth-based, heaven-bound pilgrims. The constraints and the conduct of earth-based, heaven-bound citizens. We're going to look at it. What should be those who are on their way to heaven? What should be the things that they cannot do? What are the things they can do? Look at 2 Timothy, our leading text. Chapter 1, verse 6. Look at what Paul is saying to Timothy. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou steal the gift of God, which is indeed by putting on of, the, of my hands. Now, when you become born again, you have a measure of the Spirit. You have the grace of God in your life. And the Bible is saying, and now that you're born again, do everything to encourage that grace. Do everything to enrich that grace. Uh, aspire to do everything that will make you to be much more deeper in the grace of God. And that the Spirit of God in you, you communicate with the Spirit of God all the time. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. What does it mean? What are the constraints? Look at again, verse 1. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a renewable service. I'm actually ready to verse 2, but I want to pause to make a comment on chapter, verse 1. Verse 1 says that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. How do you understand that sentence? What it means basically is this, that you are not only supposed to glorify God in your spirit, but your body, your eyes, your nails your eyelashes, your hair, everything should glorify God. Now that you are born again, you cannot barb your hair like the idol worshippers. Now that you are born again, you cannot paint like Jezebel. Now that you are born again, you cannot put on a tire that exposes your body and you become an object of seduction. You see, that's what it means to glorify God in your body. Let your body be an instrument by which the glory of God is manifested. Not your body that manifests the thoughts and the aspirations of the fashionistas of this world. The fashion icons of this world that promotes nudeness and uncleanness. As a young boy, now that you are born again, you will not dress like a disciple of Tupac. You will not dress like a disciple of the musicians of this world. You will dress as a Christian ought to dress. And that's what he say. Glorify God in your body. Look at verse 2. And be conformed, and be not conformed to this world. Wonderful, wonderful. He said, be not conformed to this world. Now, how are you conformed? How do we conform to this world? Well, we conform to this world that when your music comes out, it becomes our anthem. Be not conformed to this world. The lyrics of our music in the church do not reflect the emotions prevalent in our society. The lyrics or the message and the, the song, the tune, the way we sing, the things we do, should not reflect what is happening in this world. We should be transformed by transformed. From, we should not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I believe God that your life will be according to the perfect will of God in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I want to read from verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. You will see what, again, the, Col the church in Colossae, the challenge, the Spirit of God is putting before the church in Colossae, say, say, if ye then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Now, let me put it in our modern day language. If you, if you have ad uh, identified with Christ, let your aspirations your desire, be as those of the people in heaven where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. He said, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. 
what is the end purpose of your affection? Do you want to please God or you want to be, you want to be noted in the world? Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear, also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members. Now he's beginning to tell us. Now I'm telling you, set your affection on things above. I'm telling you, be, behave like the heaven citizens. I'm telling you, let your expression be like those who are going to be heaven. Now, if I'm telling you, the, I want to make it very clear to you what it means. These are things that must not be once mentioned in your life. He said, mortify, remove, destroy, take away. Therefore, your mem from your members, which are upon the earth, fornications, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which is say, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which also ye walk some time when ye lived in them. Do you see? He uses a past tense there. He say you walk in them. How can you say you are a Christian? And these things are seen in your life. Then you are, you are no more longer, uh, you, are not, you have not yet been transformed or renewed. He said, in which you also walk some time when you live in them, but now you also put off all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Let lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deed. Do you notice that all the things that the apostle mentioned here, they encompass both the outward things you can see and the inward manifestation which no other man can see. You know, you may have wrath in your heart and people may not know. Anger in your heart, people may not know. But the spirit has searched all things and knoweth all things. Know that there's malice there. There's things that are not right there. He said, you must deal with the things that people can see and the things that people cannot see. That's what it means. Those are the things, the things we must do, we must remove. We cannot do the constraints and conduct of earth-based, heaven-bound pilgrims. We must deal with them. Now, let me say, lie not one to another. Don't manage the truth. Don't lie to your pastor. Don't lie to your leaders. Don't lie to your parents. Lie not one to another. Seeing that he has put up the old man with his old deed, a liar is still living the old life. You see, a liar is still living the old life. Quickly, let's look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, what are the things, the conduct of heaven-bound believers? The things he cannot do, and the things he should, he should encourage in his life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says in verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the grace, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am living for Christ. I'm sold out totally for Christ. That should be the conduct of a believer. At the place of work, I'm sold out for Christ. Anything that will not glorify Christ, I will not do it. In my half family, I'm sold out totally for Christ. I will not agree with my wife like a... Uh, like Achan and his wife, Mrs. Achan, they agreed. They desired, desired the Google Babylonish garment. And when he brought it home, I said, My wife, look at the wonderful things I've got. Thank God that God has put us in a position where we can prosper. You will not go and do bribe and you agree with your wife to hide it. And then you say, God is blessing us. We will give tithes to the church. No, God does not want such money. And I pray that we will not be like that in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I want to read from verse 12. Hebrews 13. From verse 12. He says, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us, let us go forth therefore unto him without the cup, bearing his reproach. Verse 14. For herein have we no continuity, but we seek one to come. You are always wanting to look at, to, to aspire to the heaven. Look at verse 20 now. Verse 20, he said, now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of his everlasting covenant. Verse 21, make you perfect in every good works. To do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the church say, Amen. He said, now that you are a heaven-bound citizen, you have been born again, you are redeemed. He said, what will, what, what will happen? He said, God will walk in out his glory in you. 
You'll be working out his will in your life that through Jesus Christ, you will be able to make it unto that perfect day through the perfect good works in you in Jesus' name. He's always wanting to do the will of God. Now, look at First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. The constraints and the conducts of earth base, heaven bound, pilgrims. First Chronicles 29, verse 15. Verse 15 says, For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners as were all our fathers, our days on earth as a shadow, and there is none abiding. You live as a stranger here on earth. What are the things you must do? To live as pilgrims, to live as pilgrims here on earth, we must practice holiness, separation from the world. At all times, in any situation, we must practice holiness. As for the enabling grace of God to live the Holy Spirit, number two, we must practice, we must, our life must be a blessing to others. How? By the preaching the gospel of praise. And by being a blessing to members of the church. Number three, we must recognize the brevity of life. We must recognize that life is brief. If the life we live for Christ here, we can't, we, we, we what will matter eventually. And number three, number four now, we more, number five, we more, number four, we must expect difficulties in life. There will be challenges. That the Bible says, Thou therefore, as a good soldier of Christ, we should endure hardness. There will be challenges. The Bible is not, the Christian journey is not a bed of roses. It's not a bed of roses. There are going to be persecution. There are going to be tri trials. People will misunderstand you, but you must not allow them to make you look bad. You must not allow the, what people say or do or don't do to make you say, no, I'm not going to follow Christ. They will ridicule you. They will say all sorts of things against you now that you are a Christian. If you are consecrated to making heaven, you will say, let them say what they, mo they want to say. I'm only hearing the voice of Christ. And I pray that will be true for every one of us in Jesus' name. We must live by faith, both in good and bad times. You must live by faith, both in good and bad times. Don't be a fair weather Christian. When God is all, everything is all right with you, I will serve God with all my life. No, you will serve God with all your life, whether in good or bad times. And God will help, help us in Jesus' name. Now, let's close by looking at the third point. The consecrated convictions of heaven, heavenly minded citizens. The consecrated convictions of heavenly minded citizens. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 62. Now, we're looking at what is the determinate decision of the one who is going to make heaven? He says in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is feed for the kingdom of God. Let me read it again. No man, no woman, no young man, no young woman, having put his hand to the plow, made a, a, a decision to follow Christ and looking back he's lusting after the things he had left behind he's looking back, he's fit for the kingdom of God those who backslide are not fit for the kingdom of God those who are serving God, one leg in, one leg out are not fit for the kingdom of God those who are saying, well uh, I'll go and make money, when I succeed my career I'll come back, who told you you'll ever come back those who tried it before, they never came back I pray that your story will not be like that our stories will not be like that in Jesus name to stand firm as seven bound pilgrims requires courage and commitment. It takes courage to obey God. It takes courage to be faithful. It takes courage, brethren, to oppose the world and walk against the tide of popular opinion. Every one of us must make sure that we have this conviction that others may, I cannot. As we consider the, uh, the pilgrim, uh, the uh, be, uh, pilgrims who are on their way to heaven, we must make sure that we make up our mind that we will, be, we will make heaven in Jesus' name. Look at Abraham. Abraham chale had challenged for 20-something years. He had, even though God had promised him in Genesis chapter 12 that he was going to make a great nation of it, it took over 20 years for the promise to be fulfilled. As the promise was delayed, his faith was not waning in the Lord. He was being strengthened in know that he is faithful to our promise who also will do it. Are you looking up to God for anything? When you say you are going to heaven, don't allow what you have or what you don't have 
to make your faith in Christ to go down. That is the consecration of conviction of heaven minded, heavenly minded city. Those who are going to make heaven, you must make up your mind. I'm going to, what of Timothy? Timothy was given to fear, but Paul had to charge him. He said, God has not given us the spirit of fear. You look at the people you, with whom you have to do, they are intellectual scholars, people who have thick voices. They have authority behind them. You say, You have the greatest authority behind you, Timothy. Cheer us, cheer up the holy faith in you. Stand firm. Hold your, let your spine be strong and declare the word of eternity. Pastor, leader, members of the church, let's stand by our conviction. And the Lord will see us through in Jesus' name. Titus was a man of conviction. Deborah. No, you know something? It's not just about men alone. Even women. Deborah, when every man's heart were failing them, they were to to be counted. Sister, are you going to stand to be counted? Are you going to be one of those who will make it eventually here on earth and in heaven in Jesus' name? Stand firm on the truth. Stand firm on stand doctrine. Refuse to compromise your st the standard of holiness that you have had, that you know. To be courageous and steadfast, we must be fearless and bold for the truth. Be fearless and bold for the truth. We'll be faithful and committed to righteousness. You must make up your mind. I'm going to be faithful to the faith of our fathers. I'm going to be faithful to righteousness. You must love God with all your heart. Love God above dollars. Love God at both power. You see one thing I discover? This day, amongst Christians, they, many people who want to come to UK, they do arrange marriage. And they say they are Christians. They say they are Christian. They say we we'll do our own marriage. Where we we'll get it? Oh, you've got admission to come to this place. I will pay you some money. You to go and tell them I'm your husband, and then they will go and get faith certificate from the registry. And then when you come here, I will pay you certain sum of money. Then after some time, then I will have my freedom. If you die in that state, you are held bound. You see, there are people. A lot of the, a lot of values are being trampled upon. Righteousness is not being no held. But if you are going to get to heaven, you will tell God, Lord, if I need to remain where I am to make heaven, if I go to that place and I go to hell, I am not going to allow it. That is what it takes. Defend for the, defend the truth. Stand for the truth. At whatever I call, be fearless and bold for the truth. Be faithful and committed to righteousness. No matter what the enemy is dangling before you, say no. A thousand times no. I'm not going to allow it in Jesus' name. Stand for the right with, without compromise. Be disciplined and maintain a life of self-denial. And God will help us in Jesus' name. You need to be holy, both in the open and in the secret. Your relationship with the opposite sex should be pure. The letters, the, the messages you send on the internet, Facebook, um, WhatsApp, social media. Let, if Jesus Christ should say, download everything to read it, we do not be ashamed. I pray you will not be ashamed in Jesus' name. Resist temptation. Don't join them to do evil. As you do all this, God will confirm his will in your life in Jesus' name. To conclude, let's look at Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 8. And then we'll pray. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. He says, but Daniel, purpose in his heart that he will not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the princes of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I pray you will not defy yourself. You will not allow the wine and the dentists of the world to defy you. You will not allow what the world has to offer to defy you in Jesus. You see Daniel here, he was a young man in the University of Babylon. And when he was there, he became, you know, they gave him up, he got a scholarship, Nebuchadnezzar scholarship. And when he was there, they, they said, you're feeding everything, your school fees will be paid. But he knew there was a catch in that scholarship. And he said, well, I would rather lose the scholarship than to compromise my conviction. And he said, I have proposed, I will not defy myself with a portion of the, king, of the meat of the king's table. You know what? If you stand for God, even against obvious this thing, God will stand for you. God will justify you in Jesus' name. Reject any offer from Satan and his representative to make you compromise your stand. As you do that, God will stand by you. And will keep you in Jesus' name. So this evening we looked at the consecration of heavenly minded citizens. The question I want to ask you Are you minded to make heaven? Are you prepared to pay the price? Do you want to see God rise up and let's talk to the Lord? I want you to talk to the Lord this day. And we've looked at what it takes for those who have the foundation of salvation to make it. Do you have what it takes? Are you prepared to pay the price? 
Are you prepared for your life to be guided and guarded by the word of God? Are you prepared to allow the word of God to be the thing that determines all your actions and the place you go, the friends you keep? Let's talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. If, there, if, not, if you are finding difficult to live the Christian life, ask for grace. His grace is abounding towards us. He will give you the grace to do his will in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the words you have spoken to us. Thank you for the call where would you have called us, a call to consecration and commitment to the truth, commitment to living the holy life on this side of it, commitment to making sure that our life is a blessing to others through the words we speak and through the preaching of the gospel. I pray, Lord, you help us to live a life of dedicated service to you and to the kingdom in Jesus' name. Our resources and everything we have, Lord, we hand over unto you. We pray that, Lord, it will be used to glorify your name. Thank you, Father, for the answer prayers. In the mighty name of Jesus, I have prayed. Amen and amen. Oh.